Welcome to another episode of Before You Kill Yourself with your host, Leo Flowers. Today's guest is Jacqueline Kranitz, who is a former NCAA gymnast at or from the University of Iowa. Uh, she's currently in Colorado. Today we talk about so many different things. We talk about body dysmorphia. If you don't know what that is, oh, that means you're going to have to look it up. But we do talk about it or you have to tune in. Uh, we talk about how to be motivated, not intimidated by your goals. We also talk about what her mom told her to get her to eat all her fruits and veggies off of her plate. And this is and this is nutrition advice for anyone who's struggling uh, with weight or with food. Uh, this is I was like, oh, I got to write this one down. And then we also talk about what it means to be alone. Like, what does it really mean to be alone? But we get into so much more. She shares her journey of being a student athlete and what that was like in her trials and tribulations uh, and what she's evolving to and and also the, the greater purpose that she uh, is aspiring to and, uh, you know, and some things that are going on in the world that we need to know about, that we, you know, it's kind of just, it's on page three for some reason. So there's a lot in this episode. Uh, sit back, relax. And she also has one of the one of my favorite responses to the question that I ask at the end. So sit back, relax, and here is Jacqueline Kranitz. You are you are a former. I, I feel I don't like the word former. I feel like once an NCAA because uh, you know I played college football. So when people be like, "Oh, former college," no, 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 it's still in the blood. Don't no think. I can't outrun 98.9% of the people out there. So, so, <laughs> uh, so you were a uh, gymnast at Iowa State, right? University of Iowa. University of Iowa. The, Haw- the Hawkeyes. Yeah. Oh, the God. Hawkeyes. Oh, yes, yeah. Because ISU and, and U of I, those are two completely different. <laughs> completely different. Can't mix those up. Can't do that to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you did the floor, you did the beam, floor, beam, vault, and bars. And when I played college football, um, you know they offered up a sports psychologist, and uh, there was on-campus therapy. Did you take advantage of any of that? We had a sports psychologist, but I never her personally. Um, not through Iowa. Prior in my high school career, I did take advantage of just like sports psychology in general, but I never used the one we had at Iowa. Was there, was there anything that you've taken away from that experience with your sports psychologist at at that time that you, you still think about to this day? For sure. Yeah. I mean, I saw actually probably quite a few different sports psychologists to kind of just find the right fit for me when I was younger and doing some really intense gymnastics, especially when I was like, 11, 12, uh, trying to go elite, which is like going on to more of the Olympic path. Um, and I mean, I would say sports psychology does have, there's a lot of things that are applicable to life. Um, I always remember a lot of times I would have trouble in competition, like choking and like, or balking, like messing up when I knew they're on me. Um, and most of the advice that was given to me from my psychologist, my psychologist, when that would happen is to stay right exactly in the moment I was in. Cause I would always get so caught up thinking about like, Oh, what's the next skill? What's the next routine? What's the next event? And it's so simple. Like the most simple advice, like be present, but it's applicable to sports and it's also apl- applicable to life. Um, not thinking about like, while I'm doing a bar routine, not thinking about even if I have two skills ahead that are hard, still just focusing on the one I'm on. And that's something that I've kept with me all like in gymnastics and now out of gymnastics. So. It's so hard to be present. I, I, I just started, not just started, I've been meditating for a while. And even though I've been doing it since college, actually, uh, it's still hard to just sit with yourself and, and to be oh, yeah. present. Uh, do you meditate too or no? 
I have tried. I really have. And it is literally one of the hardest things. It like, you think it would be so simple. Like, Oh, I just have to sit and do nothing. As soon as you try to do nothing, you'd rather be doing like a million other things. And the hardest part about it too, is you don't even realize when your brain's like going off, like, and you're like, and you're like, Oh, and then a minute later, you're thinking about like, what you have to get at the grocery store, you know? And that's like the hardest thing about meditating for me, but I have tried it and I want to master it, but it's, it's tough. Well, I think that's the part people leave out is that as soon as you do decide to sit down, that's when all your issues want to stand up. I mean, basically mm-hmm. you're like, whoa, I thought I was over that thing from 10 years ago. I guess not. Oh yeah. Meditation. Thanks oh, yeah. a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like uh, meditating is almost like uh, Facebook. You know how like it reminds you of events from 10 years ago. It's like, hey, thought you were going to remember that breakup you went through. Yeah. Like, no, I, I didn't. I didn't, Facebook. I, I don't remember where I opted yeah. in for that. But but that's, that's what <laughs> that's what it does. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, right now on Instagram and, and through your social media, you've really become an advocate for self-care, uh, living a balanced life. Uh, no pun intended being a gymnast. Um, <laughs> and where did that, where did that come from? Because I, so many athletes um, they, balance what it's like, no, you got to be all in. You got to be a hundred percent this way or a hundred percent that way. And to, to, be, you know, be turning 21 and already be thinking about balance. Uh, where did that come from? And then what does that look like for you now? Yeah. So, I mean, being a gymnast, like you said, I'm turning 21 and I was a gymnast for, I think, 16 years. I started when I was three. So, and then was done when I was 19. So if I did the math right, if I didn't, that's embarrassing, but I think that's 16 years. (laughs) Um, And most of that time, especially as I got older, um, like even middle school, like especially middle school and high school, Um, My entire life was gymnastics. Um, As a 12, 11, 12 year old, I was training 34 hours a week, I think in the gym. Um, And I was going to camps in Texas uh, for, you know, five days at a time where it's, you know, eight hours a day of training, basically like any other kind of sports camp that's not an actual fun camp, like a training camp. Um, But I was 12 years old. And I guess for me, looking back at being that young, I wasn't really given a, as much of a choice. I was given, but when you're that young, you have a lot of influence from coaches, parents, everything like that. Um, and all the girls around me seemed to be loving it. So I was like, oh, they're telling me I'm really good. I have a lot of talent. I can go somewhere. Okay, then I guess I'm in the right spot, even if it doesn't feel like that all the time, uh, you know? And as I got older, I kind of felt that same, that same thing going on where I would question, like, is this really what I want to do? Um, and then I would also love it at the same time. So I'd always be conflicted. Um, and I had a great experience in gymnastics in high school and college. However, I just feel like there were a bunch of times where I wasn't liking it because it wasn't balanced. And I also wasn't liking it because when I would question quitting, I feel like that choice was actually, I didn't have a choice. And I know that my fellow athletes can totally attest to this. Um, From the outside, people that don't do sports, they see athletes, especially college athletes think, Oh, they're, they're on the grind. Like they love this every day. This is, this is what they do, what they love. And the reality of it is there are so many people like that. And I loved my sport. It was my craft. It was my, it was me. However, what people don't see from the outside is the waking up at five in the morning and going to weights, the, the being pressured in the gym, on the field, the, the conditioning. And yeah, I get those are things that are always going to be within it. And there's always going to be things you don't like, but the constant push of that is like way more, especially in college, um, on athletes that is just kind of overlooked. And when athletes get into that constant grind, 
I feel like so many other things in their life become overlooked, especially by coaches, teammates, friends. They just assume, oh, you know, football is you. That's what you love to do. But the football players over there are like, well, I actually, I like to snowboard. I like to paint. I like to do music. I like to do all these other things. I like self-care. I like all of this. And <clears throat> sometimes that part becomes lost. And then that's when I feel like athletes just fall into a rhythm and it's no longer about them living their best life. It's just, oh, I'm living football. I'm living gymnastics. I'm living basketball. So after I had that experience coming out and now having a platform, I, especially with my fellow athletes, want to share how important it is that they aren't their sport because so much of athletics today is now athletes feeling like their identity is completely embedded within their sport. Like, oh, I am nothing without my sport. I am worthless feeling without my sport. So that is such a hard thing, especially when people get injured, quit, or their career ends for other reasons. And so working on that while you're still in the sport is so important to me. And I feel like people need to include that. And in, we need to include that as society in athletics for <clears throat> for younger kids and in Division One, so that we can live a balanced life as athletes while we're still competing and then just flow right into a more balanced life as we get out. What now? So when we, we talked about chill, how how do you chill? Like what what's a I was watching one of your Instagram videos and you're showing your morning routine. What you know, could you talk, can you talk us through that? Because getting out of bed is, is hard some days. Very true. Yeah. Um, I do love having a morning routine. However, like, I'm not gonna lie to you. I'm not perfect. Like, and there's some days where, you know, I'm like, oh, I'm late. I roll out of bed, do whatever I have to do. Like, I'm not gonna lie to you. That happens sometimes. But I do try to include a small morning routine. Um, and for me right now, that's, wake up, go to the bathroom, brush my teeth, sometimes take a shower, sometimes not, cook breakfast or grab something. Like it's so simple. And I do, well, my mom's actually also a nutritionist and super into mental health and wellness. She has a master's degree in like health and nutrition. So she's always been teaching me about this stuff. And now that I'm on my own, I'm like learning to incorporate all of it. So she's always taught me about morning routines. So I've always been interested in that. However, a lot of like influencers I see that promote that. Sometimes what I notice is like uh, their routines have like a lot of steps. And from the outside, someone who's maybe looking to start getting in routine sees that and they're like, I don't want to do that. That seems like almost more stressful, you know, like I have to come up with all these steps and all these things that I have to do in the morning. And because that was my first thought, like morning routine. No, that's more stress. But I learned to simplify it and not make it intimidating, like literally at normal things like your teeth and grabbing something to eat, but doing it literally the same way every morning, just it really does create a sense of balance in your life. Because as soon as you get up, you know, the first thing you're going to do, you don't have to go wonder like, oh, I'm going to walk into the bathroom, brush my teeth, you know, brush my hair, whatever it is, something so small, but it just kind of like sets you for the rest of the day. Um, what I, what I love to kind of preach is like, it doesn't have to be complicated in the beginning, but if you take it one step at a time, like for me, I recently, let's say, or I want to add something new. I have these little like cards I have by my bed that just have like little quotes on them. So first thing I do, you know, I wake up, I lay there for a minute, I reach over and I read a card that has like a quote for the day. That's something so small that I could just add in to my morning routine. I already have the whole thing set. But a small thing adding in, it's no longer intimidating. And then now I have the joy of waking up with a quote in the morning, like to kind of set my mindset for the day. So just adding little things like one at a time. Uh, I love that that idea. I love that idea of building a morning routine because mm -hmm. a lot of times we see other people's routines and we think we have to completely overhaul what we're doing and then do exactly how they're doing it versus saying, is there one piece of that morning routine? Like you, you talked about opening your blinds in the morning, let the sun in right. or yep. brushing your teeth or taking a shower. Some people don't take a shower before they go to work. They just get up 
<laughs> and I no mean, judgment. Eddie, if, no judgment. If that's you, then that, that's totally fine. <laughs> if that's what makes you feel ready, then I shower at night. Be my guest, but it's making sure it's consistent. You know, with, with this pandemic and and so many people um, losing their routine, right? Because they they had a routine of of uh, coffee, w- you know, waking up, and then that commute to work was a part of their routine, et cetera, et cetera. And then have all that broken. And also the, the relationship with coworkers. A lot of people were very close with the people that they worked with. So they're not, you know, you played a sport up until you were 19 and then, you know, decided to go in a different direction. How was that for you um, emotionally? Because I, I'm assuming that you made friends on a team and you had connections and, and there oh, was yeah. a bond. Uh, how did you navigate through that? Was that easy or, or, you know, were there some nights where you're like, oh, maybe I. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. It was it's a tough transition. Um, it's a tough transition just going like from your sport to out of your sport, even in your same city, like with your friends, like with no pandemic, like for the reasons I mentioned before just because you feel like your sport's been your whole life um so for me I had that factoring in all of a sudden something that had always been a part of my identity like was no longer um and then I transferred schools from University of Iowa out here to Colorado um so and I had a bunch of friends on the team like you mentioned but I also had a lot of friends off the team um in other sports or not sports Um, So leaving all them and coming out here was hard. And I also lived by myself. I live in a studio apartment. Um, So that was all a huge change. And I live in a town I I don't know anyone in. Um, It's about like two hours from my hometown. So all of that combined, um, it was definitely, I would say probably one of the hardest things I've had to transition through in my life. Probably second would be, you know, going to college, but at least when you go to college, you feel like, and I had my team with me, I feel like I was going through it with people. This was a different kind of transition um, because I was really like out on my own. I'm like out here. I have nothing like, well, let me, let me back up. The biggest lesson I think I learned from this Uh, from the sports aspect was being okay with not like not always having something to do because as a student athlete and even just as an athlete my entire life it was always okay get up go to school this and then this and then this and then then it's nine o'clock and we go to bed and then we uh do it again so That was probably one of the biggest things I learned was how to be okay with not doing anything. Um, And that was a huge transition for sure. Um, You know, waking up and being like, well, I don't have 900 things and I don't have a sport and I don't have, you know, kind of that crutch like, oh, well, at least I have gymnastics. It was now time to look like towards the future. And what I feel like, Sometimes what happens with D1 athletes, especially unless, I mean, unless it's football ball and you kind of have the thought of like pro, like NFL, NBA, all the other sports, there's not as much opportunity. Uh, there's none in gymnastics to go pro. So what I think sometimes happens to athletes is they get stuck in the, the daily teens that they have. And then once they get out of college, they're like, oh, my God, like I'm out in the real world. Like, what am I doing? And that's when it really hit me is when I when I transitioned and I was like, oh, I'm not handed a scholarship. I have to go get a job. Like, it seems like the easiest stuff. But I was like, oh, I actually have to go apply online. Like, I actually have to get all of my documents and all of my my resume written out, which is I did gymnastics pretty much because where, where's my other experience, you know? So that was the part, um, like that I feel like was hard about the transition. 
not having every something to do all the time and learning how to function without the all of that piece in my brain being taken out by my sport and although it was really hard I feel like I grew like so much more in the past year than I have you know in the past five in the five before that because it was a different type of growth it was me Jacqueline Kranitz growing on my own without, oh, I'm growing in my sport or I'm growing on a team. It was just me out here doing it by myself. And I do feel like it needs to be incorporated a little bit more into sports in general, like teaching kids almost how, not just how to do the sport, but how to be done with it. Because I feel like so many athletes get out and they don't know how to do that. So like I said, as the transition was really hard, um, it did help me grow a lot in that aspect. You know, I, I love that you said um, how to be done with the sport, how to how to move on, because that is it's such a challenge uh, for so many of us. And uh, first of all, I want to applaud you for you know take, you. making that leap. That that's not easy. That's not, and you Thank know that's the that's the thing I miss. You know, I was watching the Super Bowl and I'm like. Oh, nobody high fives you anymore in the real world. There's no pats on the back. There's, there's not a, a you know, the, the crowd doesn't, you know, you know, cheer because you sent off that last email. There's nothing. There's just, <laughs> there's nothing like, you know, I, it, it, it is funny to me because I see people like, you know, um, you know, in the parking lot before they walk into work in the morning and they're like, you know, listening to hype music. And I'm like, you're, you're just walking into work. How, I don't know how much energy you need, but you know, that's neither here nor there. Um, cause I see that you are a huge advocate for, um, uh, you have Tigray as a channel on your Instagram. Can mm-hmm. you talk to us about that and, and why that's so important to you? Did I pronounce the name right? First of all? Uh, yeah, it would be like, I, Tigray, Tigray. It's kind of tough to pronounce. Um, yeah. So, I mean, ever since I kind of got a platform on Instagram, like big enough to share, I've posted about things that matter to me and things I think need to be spoken about that aren't really being talked about um, or are like just, for example, like the BLM, all that, the entire movement, even still, I have that up there when that, you know, this summer when that was kind of really going on. I really use my platform for that. Um, and I still do. And I still continue because I find that if you have a platform and you're not using it to speak about things that matter, you should have a platform. So for Tigray, um, my boyfriend is actually from there. So he's born in Ethiopia and he moved here and he's 11. And right now there's a civil war going on in Ethiopia. And the there's obviously there's always two sides to to everything um so if you spoke to someone who supports the prime minister they might not feel the same way about like what i'm posting about uh what's going on in tigray but the truth is is there are innocent people dying and there's children women there's thousands tens of thousands of refugees have fled um and people are being killed just because of their ethnicity, like just because they're from Tigray. And they're being killed by other Ethiopian troops or Eritrean troops, which is the neighboring country. Um, and that's something where like out here, I don't think like anyone that I knew, like I don't even know if my parents knew about it before like I posted about something like that because it wasn't even really on the news. And that's what was kind of upsetting because I, my boyfriend, you know, is from there. That's his home and this is happening in his home. And so I'm seeing that, but it's so sad then to see like, even in the U S like it wasn't even like on the news. Like you had to scroll like three pages on CNN to even like find the story. So I have a platform. So I was like, well, I, I've, I can't fix the situation, but here's what I can do. I can speak about it and I can bring awareness and post links for people to donate. 
um, if they want to, because a lot of times I really do believe people want to do good and they're just ignorant a lot of the time. Like, and I'm sure if I was not dating someone from Tigray, I probably would not know as much about it as I do. However, I do. And I'm thankful for that because now I can spread awareness. So that's why I have that up there. And it's now not just because some become something that I'm passionate about because, uh, my boyfriend is from there, but just for me too, because it's a humanitarian crisis. It's not just like, Oh, this is a war. Like, no, these are innocent civilians being there's, there's sexual assaults, there's violence, there's death just because of these people's, these people's ethnicity. And that should just be something that's talked about more. Like it doesn't matter if it's in the U S or if it's in Ethiopia or it's wherever in the world, you know? So I just wanted to spread awareness about that. I appreciate that. There, there is so much happening in the world that, you know, we're unaware of. And you're right. It's like you have to really dig to find uh, news that mm-hmm. is uh, important and impactful. Um, I do want to backtrack a little bit because, you know, you talked about your mom. Um, she's a nutritionist. Mm-hmm. And, and you're a gymnast. And, you know, I know as an athlete, <laughs> food, nutrition, you know, it's, we were, you and I were going the opposite directions. I had to, I was 275. So I was stuffing my face to get as large as possible, like literally eating like an entire pizza before bed every night. Oh my gosh. And you were like going the opposite direction, trying to be as light as a feather out there on the floor. And, you know, we know like a lot of athletes, male and female struggle with, uh, you know, body dysmorphia or have, you know, they develop eating issues. But also I I would imagine, you know, even having a mom who's a nutritionist, like it was she looking over you like that's not gluten free. Like (laughs) what, (laughs) you know, that that could either have been the the biggest blessing or the biggest curse or like just a mix of the two, you know? Like, so how, you know, when we talk about balance, how was that for you growing up in, in, in a sport? And then how are you, you know, balancing nutrition now? Yeah. So like now it's a running joke in my family. It's so funny that you say that. Like it's literally a joke where like if one of us brings junk food home or something, we like hide it from my mom. And, but the, the truth of the matter is she's so not like that. And I'm thankful because you're so right. It could be a horrible thing to have a nutritionist as a mother that could even create an eating disorder if they did not go about it correctly. If, if, you know, if you have someone over your shoulder telling you, a hundred times a day, don't eat that. Well, what are you going to do when you get on your own? You're going to eat all of it, you know? So, but my mom growing up, she would, she would just fill me with like the most nutritious food ever since I was little, like at, like at 12 years old, my favorite dinner was like grilled chicken, steamed broccoli and rice. Like, but I loved it because I grew up on it. And what she did that I loved though, is she wouldn't just say like, eat this because this is healthy she would explain to me why it was healthy. And when I'm little, you know, I'd be like, mom, stop. Like tonight I, you know, I, I just want to eat Chick-fil-A or whatever. And she would let me because her favorite saying was everything in moderation, including moderation, which I totally live by. Um, I love that saying because it's so true, but she would always explain to me why things were healthy. And like I said, I don't know if I was ready to take it in until maybe I got out on my own, but so it was all good in high school. I was, I was healthy, eating healthy, listening to my mom. And then when I got on my own, I noticed myself being like, Oh, what would mom say? So she did her job of ingraining the the thought process, not just like she, another saying I love too is teach a man. Oh wait, give a man a fish. He eats for the night, teach a man to fish. He eats for life. So she didn't just give me the food. She taught me how to pick it out for myself. So getting to college, I'd say it was a little tough, you know, cause there's a lot more like, well, first of all, not a lot of money, not a lot of, I didn't have a, a lot of transportation. Like sometimes you just eat the dorm food and if it's gross, you just eat it, you know? Um, so learning how to be okay with that was actually probably harder than trying to stay healthy, like being okay, being like, you know what, I'm going to be okay if I eat a hamburger tonight. 
or you're like, I'm going to be okay if I eat something that's not as healthy tonight. So because I always grew up with that nutrition, it was mentally teaching myself like, okay, you're not going to die if you eat something unhealthy. So that was a big part of it for me um, going into college. And I wanted to talk about a little bit, you said about the body dysmorphia, especially in uh, college athletes. And man, this issue is like so prevalent. And like, I, I hate that this is a thing, but in a lot of NCAA teams, obviously I'm not naming any, um, but it is known that they weigh their gymnasts in for lower weights, which, and even for football, like weighing higher, like you, I mean, I understand you probably had to be like huge to obviously I'm sure you're like a lineman if you're that big. Um, so you need to be that big, but for girls and for losing weight, it's a little bit different. Like when you're having gymnasts who are so talented and, and so good get on the scale and they're performing fine in the gym. They're doing what they need to do, but they're, you know, three pounds over their weight. And then they're being punished by having to do an hour of cardio a day. Like, how is that healthy at all? Um, I, on my team, never experienced anything like that. Um, our team is not or actually the opposite. We ate all the time on our team. And that, that's one thing I did love about Iowa is they, they made sure that that was, um, there was none of that toxicity coming in, but it's so prevalent and not even just gymnastics, literally any women's sport. And I wish the message was not, you have to be lighter to do well. I wish it was do your sport well. And if you're doing it well, I literally don't care how much you weigh, you know? So that's, it's so sad to me because I I just, I see girls like being like, oh, I need to lose this. I need to, I need to look like this because then I'll, then I'll be better at my sport, like directly correlating weight and being good. And it, that's just not it. Like football, a little different. Um, cause you, you kind of have to be big to be good, but it's not like they're telling you, I mean, I guess if you do play like, um, like special teams position, you might have to stay a little bit lighter. Like you can't gain like 20 pounds, but it's, it's less like nitpicky. And I feel like it is just a little bit different with girls too just in today's society with body image and everything, like some, like usually, and I'm not, men have it too. I'm not saying, um, but anyone, if you're already struggling with looking at yourself and being like, am, am I good enough? Am I this? And then now there's your entire team is telling you or your coaches like that you're not, then what's that going to do to your mental health? So that's definitely something that needs to be addressed. I think in, in the NCAA more so. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, if you're performing, if if you're completing the task as assigned, then how much you weigh shouldn't matter. You're going to turn 21 this year. You 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 have a platform. You're you're already promoting health and wellness and uh, mobility through your uh, your Instagram. When when people think of you, what is it that you feel like your your mission is at this point? Is it is it that you want to bring balance to all, balance to athletes? What What is it that you are focused? What's your mission right now? Yeah, so I've really been trying to figure that one out myself for a little bit uh, because my followers did kind of just come unexpectedly to me. I didn't build my cha- like my platform up slowly. Um, one one viral vid- video and I, I gained pretty much all the followers I have now. What was the vi- what was the video? <laughs> the video, I don't know if you've seen it, but it was called the challenge. You had to lay on your stomach and put your hands behind your back and then get up without rolling over. And I basically did it by like getting up doing the splits. Um so that that's the reason why <laughs> I have so many followers. And I just find that funny because I'm like so you're telling me I've been doing the splits for 16 years, but I take one video and now I have 125,000 followers on Instagram. 
funny how that works. But <laughs> so that kind of just took me by surprise. But so that's how I kind of gave my following. So I was like, wait, so I'm not going to be dumb. I'm going to take advantage of this, you know, not like this was a gift, like an opportunity. Uh, I want to think about what I want to use it for. And at first I kind of just started doing like gymnastics, like tricks, like for fun. And then I was like, well, I don't really want to get stuck in the like entertainment, like, oh, she did a trick. That's cool. Moving on. Like I wanted to be like, well, cause I really was like, I can do whatever I want with this. So I was kind of like, well, people always ask me, well, how, how did you get that flexible? And like, I was like, well, oh, people actually want to know. So maybe I can start to teach, you know, stretches. And then I started little stretching videos and those like, there's only like so many of those you can make. And they're hard. Cause like the one like filming them and editing them and voiceovering them. So like when I'm at the gym, especially in the middle of a pandemic, I'm like wearing a mask and there's like, it, they're a little bit harder to film. Um, and I don't, I don't have like any room in my little like studio. So it's just difficult. Uh, so sometimes I do those when I can, but as I was doing those, I was like, well, I don't just want to promote flexibility. Like I'm really passionate about all types of health. So I was like, you know what, why don't I start posting? Like I already followed a bunch of like, um, quotes pages and like motivational stuff like that on Instagram. So I was like, well, maybe it'd be cool if like, you know, at least close to once a day, I post like a quote that I just see on my page. So it started to become more like I'm promoting, I'm promoting flexibility, mental health, physical health. And then now kind of where I want to see it go. I, I do, I want to, I hope to be an inspiration, whether But not one where people look at it and it's like, wow, oh God, I'll I'll never get there. Like, I would love people to look at what I do as a goal and an inspiration, but I want to be able to give them like the little small, the, the small tidbits of information that they, as they're going through their day, they think back and they're like, oh, well, that's something small I can do. And so it's like a, the smallest little, if I can affect your life in the smallest way, because so many times we just scroll through social media, we'll see it and we'll be like, oh, that's cool. And then next, but because sometimes things seem too hard, especially you see a workout on Instagram and even me, I'm like, oh my God, damn, I'm I'm never going to do that. Like there's no way. But if I see one exercise, sometimes someone's doing, I'm like, let me add that. That's cool. So I kind of hope to be that like in the, in the health and like mental kind of circumstance, little bits of information that are just like, Oh yeah, I can do that. You know, I I would imagine, you know, starting gymnastics when you're three and then all the way up until you're 19, like how much of a social life did you, you talking about 35 hours a day plus, you know, school and plus this and plus that. When do you, when do you have time for a boyfriend? I mean, is this, is this new territory for you? Are you like, are you like Googling how to have a boyfriend? Like, how is that? Uh, yeah, that's, that'll be my recent searches. Um, because I, I, I mean, well, it is new territory for territory for me. Um, but, having a boyfriend now, uh, like a legitimate relationship where you like, you know, you put in time and effort and it's like a back and forth. Cause I did, you know, I dated a little bit in high school, but you know, gymnastics was everything. So that like, you know, it was more, I was not, you know, emotionally <laughs> like available in that sense for uh, that type of thing when I was, when I was younger, cause it was just like focus. Um, but Looking back, I tried my best to to fit stuff in um, because I am a really social person. I tend to be. As I'm getting older, I'm realizing I'm a lot more picky about who I spend my time with, and I and I end up spending a lot a lot of my time alone, which I'm getting used to, and I think is really good. Especially just this is kind of a, a side note, but for people that think being alone means you're like lonely or you don't have friends. Like I, I literally will spend like an entire, like four days straight, like 
just doing my thing. And um, I find that, and even without gymnastics now, I'm, I'm finding myself doing that. And that's, that's that part of like growing that I think is really important coming into the real world. But going back, um, when I was younger, I'd say I did a pretty good job, like trying to balance, like I'd, you know, go to school, leave school early so I could make it to practice at two practice two to seven. And then I'd be like, Oh, there's a football game after mom. Can you take me right from practice to the football game? I'd have my stuff in the car. I'd change. I'd do my little face paint and then I'd be at the football game. So like, I'd say I I did a pretty good job, like, uh, mixing in social life, but like, I never could really be like, fully involved in anything else, which I do regret a little bit because I kind of wish I got to have more of like getting involved in the school or getting involved in like other programs. But as soon as I start to feel that regret, I'm like, no, I I got to have a different involvement. I got to have a different experience from like the regular type of experience. Um, So like I said, good balance, but you know, never fully involved in anything just kind of like there sometimes and trying to get it all in uh what are you reading right now i i'm so sad i need to get more into reading more than like i used to read all the time when i was younger you know and now we got the the freaking phones just take over so bad i need to get on my reading um i was reading this book though recently it's called the untethered soul have you heard of it I have that book. It's incredible. Really? Yeah, absolutely. It's so good. And I would read little bits at a time and like highlight and sticky note. And I was like, yes, it's literally speaking what I'm thinking. And so that was probably one of the best ones I picked up recently. Um, I don't know that I've, that might've been the last book that I've read, but I have, I need to read another book like cover to cover. I want to get like a good novel going. Cause I feel like reading is just, a lost art. Jax, is there anything that we haven't discussed that you want to share with the listeners in terms of their health, their physical health, their mental health? Are there questions that, because I'm sure you get a lot of questions, I would assume from girls um, about health and fitness or even relationships. What, what are some, what are the questions that you feel like are uh, most prevalent? Well, that's actually an an interesting question in itself. Um, I, because of, I'm I'm not sure, just whatever happened, a lot of my followers are actually men. So my majority audience is men. So when I do get questions, um, a lot of times I'm trying to think, um, I, I mean, I could imagine what, like, if I had more women followers, what they would be asking, but I'd say some, like, from the men, it's usually the same thing, uh, similar. They're more like, you know, what stretch do you do for this? Or what do you recommend for, you know, morning routine? So pretty basic. Um, but some questions, I guess, like, I wish I had women asking so I could answer, um, like things to share. I would say, kind of going back to what I mentioned before about the morning routine is, and what you said about like the self-help books is like being okay with where you are at the moment, even if it's not your end goal, like have goals, but also be happy and content with where you are while you're trying to reach those goals. So it's okay to have body goals and life goals, mental goals, whatever, but don't think like, oh, well, I'm going to be happy once I get those, or I'm going to be happy once I get that body. Like, no, be happy now with what you have, but love the journey of getting there. Because at the end of the day, like, let's say you do make it and it takes you a year. Let's say you get to your body goal, if that, that's what it is in a year. And then you look back and you're like, oh, damn, well, I hated myself for that whole year and now I'm here, but I just wasted that year. I could have been having fun. Like that would have made the whole process so much better. So being motivated, but not being intimidated by the goals and really enjoying the process. That's, I have to remind myself of every day. Um, 
And, and I know this podcast is really about mental health. Um, and I, I am someone who has dealt with, you know, especially because of sports and everything. And I know a lot can relate to this, you know, t- like anxiety, some depression, things like that. I, I, I deal with that on my own. And with those type of things, what I sometimes have to remind myself, let's say I'm going through something or I'm having like a moment or like a panic attack, like something that's more like right in the moment, even if it's something that kind of lasts a week where I'm just feeling off, just I reminding myself to be where I am and, and let whatever uncomfortable feelings, whatever uncomfortable thoughts, whatever is going on in my life to just be the way that it is. Uh, because I'm there and there's nowhere else I can be. And what I've noticed is just by allowing myself to just really feel those feelings like, oh, wow, this this feels really gross, but I'm going to just feel it and let it be there because I'm still Jacqueline and I'm still here and I'm just going to feel gross right now. I feel bad. What I've noticed is that kind of helps diffuse the like scariness of the situation. Um, and I actually have the words, let it be tattooed on my arm. So I can remind myself. It's like my favorite saying and my favorite song by the Beatles, um, is to just let it be. So if I can spread that information to people who struggle with, you know, similar stuff and just stuff in life in general, that is like the most simple yet the most powerful advice that I could give. The last question I want to ask, and I ask this of all my guests, because uh, I always imagine there's one person listening in who may be on the precipice of wanting to end their life. Before you kill yourself, what would you say to them, Jacqueline? I would ask them to think about it, to really think about it. Like, imagine the whole thing, like, go there in their head, like, really, but don't do anything. Think about it. And almost experience it and then think about if they have family or anyone around them or even just people they know because I'm sure there's someone that they know that is close to them friends family whoever it is think about how they would feel and just kind of put yourself in in that situation and sometimes when you do have feelings like that taking yourself out of your own brain and your own body and really like disconnecting that and almost looking at it as like, as if you're looking down on the world or looking on the outside and taking yourself out can kind of get you out of the downward spiral of feeling like you are just, you know, not supposed to be here. So literally probably the same thing I said earlier to wrap it up, I would say sit with the feeling. If you want, let's you, you want to end this now, be with that for a day, two days, a week, a month, and allow yourself to feel those feelings. Even though you might be saying, this is just too bad. I, I can't, I can't deal with this anymore. See how strong you can be. Try to prove to yourself that you're not going to let this beat you, you know, and really not going against yourself, but being your own biggest supporter, like not thinking of the bad thoughts as you like me, Jacqueline, let's say I'm the one having those thoughts. I'm not the badness, the badness. Imagine it as something else, like a monster. You're, you're out here fighting. It's you. You're, you're not the bad thing. So you have to separate your, you are not the voice that you hear in your head. You are you. And I would say, take that step back and really look and say, is this me? Am I going to let this negative monster, this, this thing that's not even me, take me down? And like, or no, I can be with it. You know, I'm better than that. So I don't think that was a lot. And that's a very difficult question. Hopefully I, I answered that one. Okay. But yeah, to sum it up, you are not your thoughts. You are you. And 
being with however you feel and knowing that you're strong enough to deal with it. Uh, Jax, where can people find you? Plug all your things. Like online? At wherever. Wherever you want people to, to find you and, and connect with you or follow you or uh, I called you Jax. Jacqueline, wherever you yeah, want. Yeah, either way. Jax is probably easier because that's my Instagram. But that's probably the best way to reach me. I, I don't spend, I spend most of my time uh, focused on Instagram if I am on social media. Um, sometimes I like to, like I always say, keep a balance because social media can get a little toxic. Um, so I try to keep it to one main platform. I mean, Snapchat, I post fun stuff too. So that's really the more real me. Um, so you can find me on Snapchat at Jax Kranitz or Instagram, which I mean, no, Instagram at Jax Kranitz. And then my Snapchat is like linked. So. Yo, thank you so much to listeners for listening in. Remember, this podcast is not a substitute for you going to get help, for you calling the 1-800-SUICIDE or 1-800-273-TALK or the million of other phone numbers, texts, groups that I list in each and every show notes. There are, you can text somebody, you can call somebody. There are group chats. I know I have international listeners. There are international phone numbers for each and every country in the show notes. If uh, you need a suicide safety plan, that's also linked in the show notes. If you need help paying for uh, your mental health resources, there are links in the show notes. The help that you need are in the show notes. There is someone who is waiting to listen to you, to hear you, to sit with you and your monsters. Uh, if you're, if you're uh, looking for one-on-one coaching, go to thrivewithleo.com. Uh, If you're struggling, you feel alone, uh, and you want to feel connected, find meaning, go to thrivewithleo.com for one-on-one coaching with yours truly. Let's get to tomorrow together. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. Thank you so much, Leo.